We want to thank you for joining us at Cowboy Junction Church today. As you hear this message, we pray that your faith will grow and you'll be both encouraged and challenged. If you enjoy what's happening at Cowboy Junction, it would really help us out if you would subscribe, rate, review, and share this online. You can also help us reach others by partnering with us financially. You can easily give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift at cowboyjunctionchurch.com slash give. We hope you enjoy this message. So tonight is our message before Christmas. You guys, if you didn't know, you're two days away from Christmas. You're officially less than that. So if you haven't got what you needed to get, you better get going. Let me just recommend Walmart is best to be uh, ventured into at six o'clock in the morning. Yes, don't. And I think they're running 24 hours a day now. Is that right? I'm like giving Walmart updates. I'm so glad you're here. Tonight, I'm going to speak on the Christmas story, but I'm doing it in the way that, that I'm very excited about. We're in a series called Christmas at the Movies. And what we're doing is, is we're taking certain portions of the Christmas story and we're teaching on it just the way that we always do around here. But as the parable to help kind of illustrate some of the key principles and truths that we're looking at in the Christmas story, we've picked out some of our favorite movies, okay? Now, I'm going to show my age, and I don't mind, because the movie we picked for tonight happens to be one of my favorites, and here's why. I want to start off by letting all the young people in the room, all the young people in the room, I want you to know that there was a day that we only had three channels on the TV, Okay? Shocker. Dun, dun, dun. There was no ESPN. There was no ESPN. There was no HBO. There was no, there was, we had three channels. And on a foggy day, we got PBS. Okay? You remember? Who, who remembers those days? And it was a big deal. It was awesome. We got CBS, NBC, and ABC. And, and one of the ways that we knew it was guaranteed Christmas time is every year a little lovable loser named Charlie Brown would come and let us all know what the real meaning of Christmas is. So this is our movie tonight. We got it? Charlie Brown's Christmas. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. You're great and you're great to be praised. Jesus, we're here to celebrate you. We pray. This is our corporate prayer. Wherever we're at, in our story with you, whether we're just inviting the question of who is God, what did he do with, for me, and who is this son they say is Jesus. Father, tonight we pray that you would begin to shine the light and that they tonight would take one step closer to wanting a relationship with you. For the rest of us in the room who know who you are, I pray that you dust off the rust and the dust and the busyness, and the, the stressed out, and the sick kids, and the, and the bills we have to pay, and the day, and, and, and we've, when's it going to be our day off, and people coming over to our house. Lord, we put all that outside, and we breathe, and we welcome your presence. Teach us. Show us. Holy Spirit, you're invited in this place. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for everybody that doesn't know who Charlie Brown is, let me just let you know, he was our, he's our lovable loser. And that sounds mean, but you got to realize that in 1965, people were just mean. <laughs> and you think I'm joking. Some of the things that you see in the stuff that they played back then, the, the humor's not funny anymore. The things they did, and Charlie Brown was one of these old cartoons that humor sometimes doesn't translate over. And one of the funny things about Charlie Brown is how everybody picked on him. Everybody picked on Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown has some thick skin. And I know there's some people in the room going, I don't remember that being like that. Trust me, we're going to see some stuff that over the last three services, we've actually had some of the younger crowd come up to us and say, that's the meanest cartoon I've ever seen in my life. And I had to agree with them a little bit. We were, we were mean back then, I guess. But in 1965, December 9th, Charlie Brown's Christmas came out. And with it came the, the idea that it wouldn't go much further than this, just this one time showing on TV. But it was the abs absolute opposite. 
It became a phenomenon. People loved it. There were some certain things that happened that were really interesting. The uh, director of Charlie Brown's Christmas was a self-professed Jewish atheist uh, uh, liberal. That's his own way of how he described himself. But he says in the documentary, he says, I can just tell you right now, I can remember every line in that show. I can remember every line and I still hold it dear in my heart. And he said one of my favorite parts was the very end and what Linus had to say. Now, if you don't remember what Linus had to say, we're going to cover that today. But that just kind of shows you the impact that this little cartoon had on so many people. It was probably only 20 minutes long with commercials. The whole thing was 30 minutes. But to give you an idea of just how lovable of a loser uh, Charlie Brown was and also his, his pessimistic attitude, and he's negative all the time, and he was always seeing the glasses half empty. Uh, let's start this off by showing you the classic uh, uh, idea of what Charlie Brown thought of Christmas. Uh, see, that's why everybody loves Charlie Brown so much. It's because they can relate. See, when everybody else is walking around saying, this is the greatest time of year, don't you agree? Yes, yes. Isn't it great to be with family? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isn't it great to receive presents and you become a parent and then have to pay for them? And the fact is, is that we all tend to put a little fakeness on our front come Christmas. And Charlie Brown was the one that kind of was the out there person for every one of us that we can relate, even though it is one of the coolest times of year, even though this is one of the greatest times of seasons that we're in, because honestly, when the seasons begin to change in September and October, and you see this, the leaves begin to fall, it, it makes me happy. It really does. Clay Harden doesn't like it at all. In fact, one of the things that he says about the wintertime is anybody who's never had to work outside during the winter love, is the very people who love winter. And, and Clay's, Clay's, he nailed it. He really has nailed it. But I tend to get excited about it. I love the seasons change. I love it when it's not 100 degrees outside. And it tends to not blow as much. <laughs> but Charlie Brown is someone we can all relate to. Even though this should be the greatest time of year, we can sometimes see all the things wrong with it. Even though this is the time of year we celebrate the birth of our Savior, we tend to think about what we can get instead of what he gave. Right. And we take our focus off the main thing. And this is a story that Charles Schultz jumped out and said, we've got to tell this story. We've got to be able to cast a light on the most important thing. Now, if you never noticed uh, in Charlie Brown's Christmas, it, everything is directed towards the true meaning of Christmas, the story of Jesus, his birth, and what it means. This was never an issue when it came to Charles Schultz. He, he said this is something we've got to tell because if we can't talk about Jesus in our little cartoon, then where can we talk about Jesus? Before he gets to the main reason of Christmas in Charlie Brown's Christmas, he identifies a few some, some of the things that we can sometimes experience come this Christmas time. The first one that they talk about is loneliness. And even though this is one of the coolest times of year, it can also be one of the loneliest times of year. There are people that... Maybe the kids grew up, moved out, and they're, they're alone now. And it's just different. It's not the same. It's just different. There's other people that you can have a house full of folks in your house, and you can still feel kind of alone. Sometimes the outcast, the outsider. Even though this is one of the greatest times of the year, as a pastor, I want you to know, there's a lot of issues that go on during Christmas that you find that it can be the loneliest time of year. And the Bible addresses that. We're going to get to that. Let me just show you what Charlie Brown had to say about loneliness. Yeah, don't you understand sarcasm? See, the thing about loneliness, and this is where I want to just kind of get everybody's attention, we can all be lonely at some times. In, in all different aspects, have people in our life, have, not, have no people in our life, we all experience loneliness. But do you know that that's one of the central figures of what the Christmas story is all about? And just the point you say no one should be lonely, how can you still find yourself lonely? And this is exactly where Mary and Joseph were. A lot of people forget how lonely they were. They were all by themselves in this story that God was trying to do to rescue the world. There wasn't a whole group of people rallying around them. There wasn't disciples at the time. There wasn't followers. It was just Mary and Joseph and their God leading them along the way. And I want to read you something very important. I want some things to kind of pop out. It says this, in Luke chapter 2, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census 
first took place with Quirinius as governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone in their own, in their ho- in their own town, own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is known as Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Verse 7, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There's a couple of things that we have to pay attention to in the story. And I may, maybe you've read this a thousand times. Maybe this is your first time to hear the story of Mary and Joseph and the birth of Jesus. But one of the things you have to pay attention to is right in the middle of them being where God wanted them to be, something difficult, something, uh, uh, I guess, a little frustrating uh, in the form of a journey is now going to be asked of them. How come it is that when you re- hear from God the, the, the push to do something, it usually comes in some form of discomfort? It's never easy. It's never, it's never in the right time. I mean, my gosh, God, couldn't we have had this census before we got pregnant? Found out on the way we were pregnant, you know, by a test at Walgreens, and then like, hey, here we are, here he is, woo That sounded a lot better in my head. <laughs> but it doesn't happen like that. And the fact is, there's a lot of things that God will ask you to do. is never comfortable. It's always a push. And here you see God pushing them into another city. Now, this city is very important to understand. It's the city of David. It's Bethlehem. Now, you may say, well, what does it matter what city Jesus is born in? And you have to understand that through the prophecy of the Messiah, and that's who Jesus is, there is this old prophecy that, oh, Bethlehem, in you will come this amazing story, and this whole prophecy of the Messiah will come and be born here, and this push to go to Bethlehem was God saying, listen, you have to be here because it proves to the world from everyone that is here and everyone to come. That's everybody in this room. That I've had this plan way in advance. And it even says, oh, Bethlehem, look at you. You're so small. What could ever come out of you that could be good? And yet here's the push, you see. And perhaps God's pushing you, and it feels like the loneliest time in your life. It feels like the most awkward time in your life. But God's pushing you to say, come here. If you stay here I can't do what I need to do. So have the faith to step out and journey. Take a trip. Take a trip in your faith to go to the place that I'm asking you to go, and then you'll see the whole plan I've been put together, that I've put together before I even told you about it. Wouldn't you think it'd be even better to not be nine months pregnant, eight months pregnant while you're journeying? And here she is. Let me tell you, there's some discomfort that you may feel too. But this is the story that we all draw from to realize that God is still in control. And it's not going to take your ability to pull off God's plan. Right. You may say it again. Yeah, yeah. It is not going to take God's abil- your ability to do God's plan. Right. It is going to take your faith in God's plan to see his ability. Gosh, I love my front row preaching me down right now. That is so good. It's like I'm married to one of them. But guys, come on. I think that deserves an amen. Good job. The second thing I want you to notice is that she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room at the inn. And sometimes our very loneliness is because we're unwilling for God to stretch us and move us to where we need to be. And in this case, you see what can happen when we don't make room for God's plan in our life. Sometimes that's what loneliness feels like. You don't see the big picture that God's got all around you when you focus on the small things that you keep concentrating on. In this case, an innkeeper was just trying to fill his in, and he did it, and he was done. But there was a bigger plan. And I, I have this question. Do you think 
the older the innkeeper got, he regretted not making room for the Christ child that night. And sometimes the loneliness that we feel is the regret that we have that we didn't make room for God's plan while he was asking us to make room for his plan. Loneliness is huge. And loneliness is a huge story in the Jesus story. Let me show you something real quick, this point I want to give before we go on the next one. The most needed ministry in the world today is love. Love in your marriage, love in your, with your kids, love in your home, love in your community. And the reason why I bring this up is because the very thing we don't want to do is go from our comfort zone into the discomfort zone of loving people. But it's the most needed ministry in the world today. And it hurts to give your best when others don't see how valuable your best is. But you love them anyway. And when you don't know what to do, you love them even more. And you keep loving and you keep loving. And the whole story is wrapped around discomfort to comfort. Or, dis or discomfort to the peace of knowing that God is in control. And I think for this Christmas season, to recognize the people around you who need a little love yeah. instead of focusing on maybe the love you're not getting. Right. You can be the miracle. So you can be the miracle in somebody's life. Let's do it again. The most needed ministry in the world today is love. But Charles Schultz didn't want to stop there. He wanted to talk about something he felt like was becoming an issue in 1965. He said, commercialism is kind of taking over the heart of the real Christmas story. So he portrayed it through his favorite little character, Charlie Brown, and this is what they had to say about it. Tens and twenties. I don't see anything wrong with tens and twenties, by the way. I, I love green, Heather. Hey, listen, the whole idea of gift giving during Christmas is actually a very godly thing. It's one of the things that you see is the first acts of honor bestowed to the Christ child. It's really cool to see these three wise men. We call them the three wise men, but they're called the magi. And they were, they were very intelligent, smart individuals. They were leaders. And they really kind of led the whole heart of some of the things that we do come Christmas time. Maybe you didn't realize that the whole gift giving during Christmas time, on the level that we see it today to where people are like going bankrupt, giving gifts. It's not always been like that. For the longest time, it was just an exchange to remind everyone about the three, what, what the three wise men did. Let me tell you the story of the three wise men. It says this in Matthew chapter two, verse one, it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, so this is after the birth of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, different town. So he's a little bit older now. And it says in verse two, same where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. In verse 10, the story continues. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. This is the star that directed the wise men to where Jesus was. And when he had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And these have been the three gifts that inspired the gift giving. But I want you to pay attention to some real important parts that maybe sometimes we forget about. I always thought growing up the gift giving was basically to tell me how awesome I was. I mean, it was just basically, have you been a good boy or a bad boy? I've been a good boy, okay? Then you get good gifts, and this is a celebration of how great Ty has been this year. But that's not what this gift giving is exchanged. Exchange is taking place. It's actually a honor, a worship to the king, Jesus. And you see three important gifts that you have to pay attention to. The first one was gold. Gold being the sign of kingship. The first wise man wanted to give gold in recognition of Jesus being the king of the Jews. He didn't give it because he just had gold laying around. He specifically chose it to recognize the kingship. Frankincense. Frankincense is an incense. It's burnt. It gives this beautiful smell, but it's the honor of deity, of a god. So the first 
wise men gave gold to recognize Jesus as king. The second gave incense, frankincense, to recognize him as God. And these are the two things that we have to recognize too. Are we doing that in our life? Are we honoring God by recognizing him as the number one spot in our life as our king and also our God that came to rescue the world? These are the things that all of a sudden it goes beyond drones and it goes beyond video games. Those things are great, by the way. I love them. However, if they become the number one thing in our life, we miss the number one thing. And the gift giving was something to shine a light on. Who's the number one? Who has the number one spot in your heart? Who is the king of your life? Who is the God that you put your faith in, you put your hope in, and you put your trust in? And to recognize how we honor him can be judged by the treasures that we give. The third gift was myrrh. This was a very very prophetic gift. Not only was Jesus the Christ child, born of a virgin, but he would also become the sacrificial lamb. At 33 years old, Jesus would die on the cross, and it was very prophetic. It was important. It was necessary. Jesus knew this would happen. He knew he would become the sins of the world. This myrrh was an embalming mineral that would keep bodies longer. And how brash this king, this this wise man must have been. But he heard something in his heart that he followed through on. And he gave a prophetic gift. And the first king honored him for being the king. The first wise man honored him for being the king. The second wise man honored him for being God. But the third wise man honored him for who he would be someday. Because it was from his death, his burial, and his resurrection that the world would be saved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Emmanuel is the celebration name we give Jesus. It means God came to be with us. With that same idea, do you know what the gospel means? The gospel means the good news. The good news that the world isn't lost, that now people have a path back to Jesus, back to God through Jesus. And this is the good news that all men have a choice and you can choose a path to life and not death. And if we know the good news story, let me ask you a question. If you know the good news story, are you good news? I mean, think about it. Are you good news when you walk into the office? Because let's just face it, it gets, it gets beyond just being popular and people like you. I'm talking about if Jesus is good news, are you the good news to the people that are around you? Are you good news to your family? Are you good news to your community? When we all get the family together and we're, always think, we're already thinking, we're all going to get along this year, are we, is, is she going to get competitive again? Is, is, is he going to remember the cranberry sauce? Are they going to show up on time? Are you good news? And the only way we will be good news is if we know the good news that Jesus is. Emmanuel. God came to dwell in us. Last and final thing, if you ever watched Charlie Brown's Christmas, the tree, the tree is something you never forget. Because there's this story with the tree in our story today. And the tree story takes us to exactly where all of us can find ourselves. And as you watch this clip and as you watch this tree story come unfold, it begin to unfold, Remember, the tree in this story represents every one of us. The story of the Christmas tree still is in our hearts to this day because the, the fact is, is that if you ever see a scraggly, small, embarrassing little tree on a stand, you always refer to it as a... See how that is so true. And, 
And the fact is, is that this is the story of every one of our lives. And it's also the story of all the people that could be around you. Do you know that sometimes we feel the, I guess, the, the, the not, the, we don't feel valued. We don't feel like we, we, we fit in. It's like we're missing something. We're different. We're odd. And, and we can miss what God sees in us. The second thing is, is that you can also look at the people around you and not see their value either. I mean, come on, let's think about this. Don't miss this. You can be around people every day that you just slowly, every day, devalue just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. One of the old men that used to live in Lovington, uh, he's moved off, but gosh, we spent a lot of time together there for a while. And he would literally walk up to people and say, hey, tell me your story. And it would be kind of embarrassing a little bit. I'm like, they, they don't look like they want to tell you their story. Or they look like they're busy. And people would stop. They would stop because no one's ever asked them that question before. Tell me your story. And some of them were so thrown off, they would say, what do you mean? And he would just turn to me and say, everybody has a story. Tell me your story. He said, where are you from? And they'd start by where they're from. Who's your parents? Where'd you grow up? How'd you grow up? Tell me your story. And they begin to tell story, stories about themselves. And the fact is, is that you would look at them and think, there's nothing spectacular about them. And the reality is, is that as they begin to tell you their story, everybody has a fascinating life. Everybody has a fascinating life. It's just that sometimes we're more interested in our story than somebody else's story. And this is the story of our Christmas tree. The point I want to make is this. It's not that God works in mysterious ways as much as God works in unexpected ways. Think about this. It's not that God uses mysterious ways when he uses people. It's that he sometimes uses unexpected people to do some amazing ways. And that's what he wants to do in you. Maybe you don't value yourself. Possibly because you don't value yourself, you don't value others. But I want to tell you that God does some pretty unexpected picking to do the ways that he wants to do. And maybe we should learn from that. When they picked a tree, they didn't pick the biggest tree and the nicest tree and the broadest tree and the best tree. They picked little tree. And there was something about Charlie Brown who says, I don't know. I think it could be a pretty cool little tree. And everybody mocked it and everybody made fun of it. But you saw that once everybody saw the heart of Christmas and the value that Jesus puts on us, people began to value that little tree. And they fixed it up. And everybody contributed something. Everybody contributed something. And all of a sudden, you realize it's not so much that God works in mysterious ways as much as God works in, I don't know, unexpected little ways. Right now, there's a pretty unexpected little guy that you see around here, especially on Monday nights, named Chaplain Donald Stover. He's the chaplain at at the racetrack in Zia Park. He's a very unexpected person God keeps using He has the biggest heart for Jesus I have ever met in my entire life. If you've ever wondered what an angel looks like, he doesn't look like Don. (laughs) But he acts a lot like Don. Don's got this big old ponytail about the back, and he is just always going. And because he loves Jesus, he loves people so much. Let me tell you what Donald is doing right now. Donald doesn't have any family, he doesn't have any kids, he doesn't have anywhere to go for Christmas, but that doesn't bother him one bit. Because several years ago, he got invited to go to Juarez, to a little uh, orphanage there, and he got involved and then came back and just for, for many years now has been, been raising money so that he can go over there and give Christmas toys away to all the orphanage, or, orphans in Juarez. This year, however, has been a really interesting year. He went over to scout out the place. Cowboy Junction sends him with money. And maybe you want to donate today to help out Don, but we've already sent a bunch of money. A lot of the racetrack people send money. And he goes over and he buys presents. But this year, 
the director of the orphanage said, Don, you got time? I want to go show you something. And he took him down to a bridge. And underneath the bridge is normally where a few homeless people live. But this year, there were several hundred homeless people. Hundred. They've built a makeshift fort, and several hundred of them live inside this makeshift fort. And the reason why is because these people aren't from Mores. In fact, just recently, the smugglers from southern Mexico smuggled them and promised them for $6,000 we will get you to the United States, but got them to Juarez and at gunpoint kicked all of them out, and now they're homeless, penniless, and don't know how to get home or how to get to the United States, and they're stuck underneath a bridge in Juarez. They made a fort because certain people keep trying to kidnap their children to move them into sex slavery. And Don came home and told us all about this. Do you guys sometimes feel like you want to love people and you want to do some unexpected things that God's asking you to do, but it's like you don't know where to start? It's like, can one person make a difference? And the answer is yes, and we all know yes, but down deep there's this like, but man, I'd like to see it one time in my life, God. Some kind of difference being made. But here's this unexpected little guy with a ponytail at 60, 70 years old that just hustles down there every year. He came back and he told me about it. And I said, Don, you figure out what you need. And, and we want to make sure you get it. Don loaded up with blankets and food and clothes. And Don's down there scouting things out to figure out how we can help. And this is a hard situation. I mean, can you, here I am talking about Juarez and smugglers and people and and get in the United States, can you think of a more controversial issue right now? Some people would be sitting back going, well, I don't think we should do anything. And you know what? I think we should. I think we should. You know why? Because you've got to ask your question. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And sometimes I feel like this little tree. It's like, God, I know you call me to pastor, but sometimes I feel like I ain't, I ain't got it. How do you make a difference in a world that's bleeding all over the place? You do it one at a time, right. one at a time, right. one at a time. But it happens in your home too. Who do you start with? The first person that walks through your door. How do you help? The first opportunity you get. What do I do? The first chance, take it. Because if you don't do it then, you won't do it later either. Let me show you one more point. People just need a little love. That's all they need. People just need a little love. So, with that, it brings us to our end. And with it, Charlie Brown, after being mocked and made fun of, and he felt like, how in the world do you make a difference? And how in the world do you experience Christmas if everybody thinks it's commercialism? And, you know, I get what I want, and everybody's lonely. And Charlie Brown, in all of his try just feels so let down. And he shouts out the statement we've all made at some point in our life. Can anybody tell me the real meaning of Christmas? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find a babe wrapped in swallowing clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And that, Charlie Brown, is the meaning of Christmas. There's a very historic thing that takes place. As you may have noticed, our Linus 
set his blanket down. This little clip is the only time in Charlie Brown history that Linus lays his blanket down. Everything that he welcomed as security, everything that gave him comfort, everything that gave him peace, everything that calmed him down, he was willing to lay down because in this portion that Linus reads, he sets it down in the word afraid. Charles Schultz did this for a reason. Because to him, he said this, the greatest story of Christmas is you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be afraid of people anymore. You don't have to be afraid of being inadequate anymore. Trust me, set your fear down, and don't be afraid anymore. This is actually a pretty big part for Heather and I as parents because this was a huge challenge for Hudson to do this. But Hudson stepped out of his comfort zone and the reason why this was such a big deal for Hudson to read to you the Christmas Linus part is because Hudson has a learning disability and he has dyslexia. And he doesn't read well. And for the past many, many years, Hudson struggled reading and struggled reading and struggled reading. And even as I felt the Holy Spirit say, you know what you ought to do? You ought to get Hudson to do it. I'm like, that's cool, God. Thanks. He said, no, you really ought to get Hudson to do it. It's a great idea if he could only do it. He said, you should get Hudson to do it. I said, you want Hudson to do it? And Hudson, I went home and talked to him, and he said, uh, and we practiced, and we practiced, and we practiced. Yesterday, his Junction Christian Academy teachers were here, and Creel's here tonight. I don't know where you're at, Creel. But Krill knows the struggle Hudson has had reading. But before you tonight was our, our family gift through Hus Hudson as he was willing to lay down his fear to do something <laughs> he had to do. And I thought he did it pretty good. The second thing that happens is Linus picks his blanket back up. And the first thing that Linus does is he wraps the tree in his blanket. Do you know that that's exactly where your fears belong? At the feet of Jesus. To step past your insecurities. To step past the things that scare you. All the voices in your head of the why you can't. Why you shouldn't. And maybe you should sit down and say, hmm. If God be for me, who can be against me? Yeah. Today I'd like for you to stand to your feet. And if you would, would you pick up your candle? As we close today, the story of Christmas is the story of when Jesus came to be the light of the world. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, it gives us the very first idea of the depth and the width and the length of the story of the Messiah, Jesus, and him showing up. It says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not know what to do with it. 
And this is the story of what Jesus does every time we continue to seek after him. Just to the point to where we don't know what to do and we don't know how to act and we don't know how to love and we don't know how to forgive. And it's very much like the darkness you see all around us right now. I mean, they, they have it dark for a reason. It's dark because now we're going to tell the story through the candles that we hold as you begin to find the darkness has, the, has to flee as the light does what light does. But what happens when we begin to share the light? What happens when one by one we go to our friends and the light begins to be a chain reaction? Perhaps it's love. By loving one person, someone gets to experience love. And then someone passes it on to the next person and the next. Do you realize that there you go. Good job. Do you realize that this is the story of how every one of us found Jesus? If someone, if Jesus didn't tell the twelve, and the twelve hadn't told the thousands, and the thousands hadn't have told the hundred thousands, and the hundred thousands hadn't have told the millions, and the millions hadn't have told the billions. And then all of a sudden, one day it shows up at a little country church in southeastern New Mexico called Cowboy Junction. If no one had shared their light, we wouldn't know the story today. But as you hold in your hand the light, I have to ask you a question. Have you asked the light of the world, Jesus, to be the light of your life? To drive away darkness... You could do that right now. And for others, you need to remember something very important. You have to choose the light. You have to choose it. You have to fight for it. You have to ask for it. And He will come. And the darkness has to flee. So in celebration of the Messiah being born, let's hold our candles Let's sing one of the old songs that have guided us through this Christmas time, Silent Night. And let's remember the greatest gift our God has ever given us, His Son, Jesus.
For our closing, the Bean family, without Brady, doggone Brady, we wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. And we wanted to pray that the peace that passes all understanding would flood your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus, our Savior. I pray that this Christmas season you would honor the Father for the King that He is and that He would have the number one spot in your heart, your throne of your heart, and that you would worship Him as your God and you would know that He has the faith the faith that you have, so many times, it's a, it, you've got to understand it's the currency of heaven, faith. And our faith tells us, He is my Father. He is my God. But then at the same time, we worship Him. That not only is He born, but He was born to die. And as He died, three days later, He also rose again. Amen. And He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And today we have life, life more abundant because of Christ Jesus. Amen. So on behalf of the Bean family, we would like to wish you Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Cowboy Junction, it's time for us to love God, love people, and have no limits in our life. I love you. We love you. Jesus loves you. Don't you ever forget it. God bless you guys and have a great week. Merry Christmas in the Lord.